In section 4.4, we look at the real zeros of polynomial functions. We're going to learn a whole lot more about graphing now with the polynomial functions. We're going to start with the factor theorem. The factor theorem says that a polynomial f of x has a factor x minus k if and only if f of k is equal to 0. f of k equals 0 comes from our remainder theorem, and that means that the remainder is equal to 0 and we just talked about that in section 4.3. A factor, remember, is something that divides evenly into something. If I was talking about numbers, I would say 3 and 5 are factors of 15 because 15 divided by 3 goes evenly. If the remainder is 0, that means that you've got something that will divide evenly. If the function is equal to 0 and I'm looking at graphs, what that means is those are my x-intercepts because that's where y is equal to 0. In example 1, we see that our zeros occur at negative 1, 1, and 2. How would I write those zeros as factors of f of x? Remember, when I write this as a factor, I have to be able to set that factor equal to 0 and solve for x and get negative 1. So how would I write negative 1 as a factor? x plus 1. And when my 0 is at 1, that factor would be x minus 1. And when the 0 is at 2, the factor would be x minus 2. So based on the graph and the fact that these are the zeros, these would be the factors for this graph. Our leading coefficient here is positive, but look at the graph. This is a third degree because our endpoints are going in opposite direction. Do you all remember what we looked at in 4.2 with the end behavior? Our degree here would be 3 because I have x cubed. That works with the two turning points and the fact that the endpoints are going in opposite direction. But would my leading coefficient here be positive or negative? It would have to be negative. If I asked for it, and I didn't ask for it in this problem, I just said list the factors, there they are, you would need to have a negative leading coefficient for this graph. I'm just taking advantage of a teachable moment. It's not something that was asked in this particular problem. Now let's talk about the multiplicities of the zeros. If your graph comes down and it touches the x-axis but it doesn't cross through it, that means that you have an even multiplicity. If your graph crosses the x-axis, you have an odd multiplicity. So here in this function we're looking at f of x equals x plus 2 quantity squared. Because that factor is equal or is raised to a power of 2, we say that it has a multiplicity of 2. 2 is an even number, so the graph will just touch the x-axis. Does that make sense? On the, and the, the factor is x plus 2. The 0 is at negative 2. Remember, the zeros and the factors are going to have opposite signs because that factor is x minus k when x equals k is the root or the 0. On this graph, we have zeros at negative 1 and 2, which means that I have factors x plus 1 and x minus 2. Both of these cross the x-axis, which means that they have to be raised to odd powers. If there's no power here, we assume the power to be 1. I also want you to notice what happens when our multiplicity is 3 instead of 1. Here at x minus 1, do you see how this graph kind of flattens out a little bit at the x-axis? The higher the multiplicity, the flatter that goes. This is almost vertical right here when it crosses, so that means that this is to a degree of 1. I'm going to make that point again in the future. So the higher the multiplicity, the flatter the graph is. So on our function, x plus 1 is got a multiplicity of 3, the graph kind of flattens out here at negative 1, which is the 0 from this factor. What you need to remember is that even power touches and an odd power crosses the x-axis. Suppose we have a polynomial written like this and it has n real zeros, where c1, c2, c3, all the way out to cn are zeros, where a distinct zero is listed as many times as its multiplicity then f of x can be written in completely factored form as this, where we have our factors written out, the factors come from the zeros, and we may have a constant that's different out front. We're going to use this completely factored form to work example two. So on part a, I notice that my leading coefficient is what? My leading coefficient is equal to seven. I'm told that my zeros are at one half and four. If my zeros are at 1 half and 4, what does that mean that my factors are going to be? x minus a half and x minus 4. 
So that means that my function f of x, or my polynomial, can be written as the constant that's going to be out front is the leading coefficient. So that would be 7 times x minus 1 half times x minus 4. And this would be the completely factored form where we have a constant times all of our factors. If you want to multiply this out and distribute the 7, you're going to see that you get this right here. So if I multiplied all this out, it's not about solving anything. You're rewriting this polynomial in its completely factored form. And to check your answer, you could FOIL this out, distribute the 7, and see that this is exactly what you get. If you know these rules and how the relationship works with the factors and the zeros and the leading coefficient, you don't have to go through the process of factoring this out if you know some of your zeros. All right, for part B, what is our leading coefficient? And what are the factors? We get these factors from the zeros. Notice the signs are different when I write my zeros as factors. So my final answer here would be f of x equals what? 5 times x plus 2 times x minus 1 times x minus 2. That's completely factored form. It's not too bad to do when I'm showing you this problem, but on a test when it's all mixed up with other things, you've got to remember what to do when. The best way to remember that is to practice. Practice. You've got to do the homework. In example 3, we're asked to use the graph of f to factor this. The first thing I want you to observe is what is your leading coefficient? What do you know about the degree of this polynomial based on this shape? There's two turning points and my endpoints are going in opposite direction. Not negative. Well, it is a negative leading coefficient. Well, yay, we have a negative leading coefficient. What's going to be the degree, the power on x? Is it even or odd? Odd. And how many zeros do I have? I have three zeros, so that means that each one of these zeros are going to give me a factor for my cubic function. So my zeros are at negative 1, 1, and 2. How would I write those as factors? So my function here will factor into f of x equals negative 1 half times x plus 1 times x minus 1 times x minus 2, where each one of these factors came from the zero. Isn't this an easier way to factor than trying to use synthetic division or long division or anything else? Sure, and as long as you've got a graph and you have the same number of x-intercepts as the power on the function, you can use this technique. In example 4, we're told that the polynomial, and it's a cubic polynomial, has a 0 of 1. Express f of x in complete factored form. Because it has a 0 of 1, what does that tell us about a factor? Because I know a factor, that means that it has to divide evenly into this cubic function. I don't know how to factor a cubic function, but I do know how to factor a quadratic. So what I can do is I can use synthetic division and this factor to figure out what a quadratic is and then factor the quadratic using the techniques from chapter 3. So when I divide this, do y'all want to use synthetic division or long division? Synthetic division. What would I put over here for my number? 1. Positive 1. Because x minus 1 is the factor, the 0 is what goes here, and that's going to be 1. What numbers go across the top? These are the constants in front of my powers of x, the coefficients. So what do I do with the synthetic division? Bring the negative 2 straight down. Then 1 times negative 2 is negative 2. Negative 6 minus 2 is negative 8. 1 times negative 8 is negative 8. 2 minus 8 is negative 6. 1 times negative 6 is negative 6. 6 minus 6 is 0, and that's my remainder. So what will my quadratic be? Negative 2x squared minus 8x minus 6. Do I have a common factor I can pull out of this? This is equal to negative 2 times x squared plus 4x plus 3. Will this factor? This factors into x plus 1 times x plus 3, doesn't it? So there's two factors and a constant that I factored out. What's my other factor going to be? x minus 1. So my function f of x can be written as negative 2 times I had the x minus 1 as a factor already and that negative 2 came up here and then I have a x minus 1 from this factor right here 
and then I have an x plus 1 and an x plus 3 and that would be the completely factored form. On the rational zero test there's several things we're going to look at. So for the rational zero test part A says at a zero of even multiplicity the graph does not cross the x-axis. Here we have an even multiplicity because the graph does not cross the x-axis. So this would be a multiplicity of 2 here. At a zero of odd multiplicity the graph crosses the x-axis. So our graph crosses here it crosses here and it crosses here. So this would be odd because it crosses. We touch here, that's even. We have odd multiplicity here and we have odd multiplicity here. Now with the odd multiplicity, if the graph kind of flattens out, that means that we're looking at a higher multiplicity than just one. So right here, this factor that's raised to an odd multiplicity is three because it kind of flattens out. Here our multiplicity would be 1 and that's reflected right here in this factor because the graph kind of goes straight through but it, the graph kind of flattens out right here at this x-intercept and that means that our multiplicity has got to be odd but it's got to be a higher power than 1 so we're going to say that it's 3. What would be the degree of this polynomial right here? I have a x cubed times a x, x to the fourth the endpoints are going up in the same direction so that agrees with what we learned about end behavior. The leading coefficient is going to be positive because my endpoints are pointing up. Here I have an x cubed times an x squared. What power is that? x to the fifth because when you multiply powers you add the exponents. So that would be x to the fifth. Our endpoints are going in opposite direction so that satisfies the fact that we have an odd degree. I'm just trying to review a little bit as we go along something about the endpoint behavior. All right, on example five, when you are asked to write the complete factored form, the first thing you want to do is identify what your x-intercepts are, what the multiplicity or the power on those factors will be. Multiplicity just means the power on the factor. I don't know if that was clear before, was it? No, it wasn't. So multiplicity just means the power on the factors. For example, if you have a factor x plus 2 squared, that would have a multiplicity of 2 because the power is 2. Here the graph touches. Is that multiplicity going to be even or odd? Even because it touches. So that means that one of my factors will be x plus or minus 2 plus 2 and the power will be even so we're going to call that square because that graph doesn't flatten out very much there. Here we have another x-intercept. What will that factor be? x minus 1. Is the multiplicity even or odd? odd. Does it flatten out here or is it going to, is it, is the multiplicity going to be 1 or is it going to be 3? It's going to be 3. And another reason you know that is you were told in the problem that we have to have a fifth degree polynomial. So my polynomial is going to be x squared times x cubed gives me an x to the fifth. I left a blank here because I'm not sure if this is going to be a positive one or a negative one. How do I check to see if this leading coefficient should be positive or negative? What do I look at? The end point behavior. If I'm going in this direction where I start up high and I go down low, if you start at the top and work your way down, that's negative leading coefficient. The fact that the ends are pointing in opposite directions means I have an odd degree. The degree of this polynomial is x to the fifth, so we would say the degree is 5, and the leading coefficient is negative because I started at the top and I worked my way down. Remember that from 4.2? So this would be our final answer here. We can write out what this function is just by looking at the graph. You don't have to put the 1 here. It's assumed there if you just put a negative because 1 times something is that thing. I would not count it wrong if you put a negative 1, but you don't have to. You can just leave it negative like that. What's our y-intercept here? What's this y-intercept? 4. So there's a point right here at 0, 4. If we let x be 0, I end up with 2 squared is 4 and negative 1 cubed is negative 1. Negative 1 times 4 times negative 1 is we have our function. We factored or we wrote this polynomial from the graph. That's impressive. Before you came in here today you probably couldn't have done that, right? If you do your homework when you walk out of here you'll be able to recreate that on your test.
The rational zero test says that if we let f of x be a polynomial function where the leading co where a is not equal to zero, meaning we've got numbers here for our leading coefficient and this constant term with integer coefficients, if p over q is a rational number written in lowest terms, and if p over q is a zero of this polynomial, meaning it's a factor, uh, x minus p over q would be a factor, p is a factor of the constant term and q is a factor of the leading coefficient. The way we write all of our possible rational roots is we look at factors of p over factors of q where p is the constant term and q is the leading coefficient. All possible rational roots are of the form p over q where p is factors of the constant and q is factors of your leading coefficient. There's your leading coefficient a sub n, a sub naught is your constant term. So the first thing I want to do, for example 6, we're asked to find all rational zeros, then factor the polynomial function. The first thing I want to do is list all possible rational roots. In order to do that, I need factors of p. p is 2. The factors of 2 are plus or minus 1 and plus or minus 2. They could be positive or negative because 1 times 2 is 2, negative 1 times negative 2 is also 2. Factors of q are going to be plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, q remember is negative 10, plus or minus 5, and plus or minus 10. These are the factors of p and the factors of q. Now according to the rational zero test, I need to look at p divided by q. Well that's going to be 1 divided by 1 is 1, 1 divided by 2 is 1 half, 1 divided by 5 is 1 fifth, 1 divided by 10 is 1 tenth, and these could be positive or negative, that's why I'm putting the one plus or minus in front of them. And then I take 2 over each one of these factors in Q, and 2 divided by 1 is 2, 2 divided by 2 is 1, and I've already got that so I'm not going to write it down again. 2 divided by 5 is 2 fifths, and 2 divided by 10 is 1 fifth, and I already have 1 fifth so I'm not going to write it down again. So if I have a rational root, it's going to be one of these numbers. So these are all possible rational roots. And if I give you this problem on a test, I want, I want to see these answers for your possible rational roots. Now I need to factor this. Well, in order to help me narrow down which one of these roots is the one that I need for my factors, I'm going to look at the graph of the function. So I've got negative 10x cubed minus 17x squared plus 7x plus 2. And I just want to see this on a standard window, so I'm going to hit zoom 6 because this goes from negative 10 to 10 and the largest and smallest possible rational roots I had were negative 10 and 10 and I get this for my graph. Looking at this graph and looking at my possible rational roots, it looks like the graph is going to cross at an integer there. What is that number going to be? Negative 2. That means that what is a factor? x plus 2 is a factor. So I have a cubic function. I have a linear factor. I can use this linear factor to work this down to a quadratic, can I? And then I can get the rest of the factors from the quadratic. So uh, do y'all want to use synthetic division or long division? I don't even know why I bother showing you long division. Well, because some things you've got to use long division for, but we can use synthetic division. So I have x plus 2 is a factor, and I need to find other factors. So using the synthetic division, what number do I put over here? A 2 or a negative 2? Negative 2. And then what do I use for my coefficients here? Negative 10, negative 17, 7 and 2. Bring the 10 straight down. Negative 2 times negative 10 is, and negative 17 plus 20 is 3. Negative 2 times 3 is negative 6. 7 minus 6 is 1, and negative 2 times 1 is negative 2. My remainder is 0. So what are my other factors? So if x minus 2 is a factor, here's my other factor. I need to factor this further. First of all, I want to pull that negative out. Are you all okay with that? Because when I'm factoring, I like my leading coefficient to be positive. So I'm going to pull that negative out, and what's that going to leave me on the inside? 
So when I pull the negative out, that leaves me 10x squared that's positive minus 3x minus 1. Now I need to factor this quadratic, and it will factor. Let's do 5x and 2x, So because 5 times 2 is 10. Here I'm going to have a 1 and a 1. I need factors of, of where the outside and the inside subtract and give me negative 3. So let's do a negative 5x plus 2x will give me that negative 3 in the middle. So my completely factored form is going to be f of x equals the negative comes from right here. 5x plus 1 times 2x minus 1 times, I need another factor because this is a cubic function, what is it? The x plus 2 that I got right here. So my other roots this negative root right here is going to be negative one-fifth, that came from this factor, and this one's a positive one-half, and that came from this factor. It's just easier to spot that linear factor that happened to be an integer, so it was one of our possible rational roots. Notice the other roots that we had were listed up here. It's just easier to look from the graph and tell which one's the integer. Okay, the last thing that we're going to go over in this section is something called Descartes' Rule of Signs. Descartes' rules of signs gives us the number of possible positive and negative roots. Descartes' rule of signs says, let P of X define a polynomial function with real coefficients and a non-zero constant term with terms in descending powers of X. So you have to write your polynomial in order in descending power of X. So you start with your highest power first and then don't skip any powers going down. Part A says the number of positive real zeros either equals the number of variations in sign changes occurring in the coefficients or is less than the number of variations by a positive even integer, also known as 2. Part B is how we get the number of possible negative real zeros. And we replace x with negative x and then count the number of sign changes. It's going to be equal to the number of sign changes or decreased by 2. And we're going to apply this rule in number 7. So the way we start is we look at p of x. To get your possible positive zeros, we look at p of x. p of x is 3x to the fourth plus 2x cubed minus 8x squared minus 10x minus 1. How many sign changes did I have? I go positive, positive, sign didn't change, positive, negative, there's one sign change, and then these stay negative, there's no more sign changes. There's only one sign change, so that means the number of possible positive zeros is equal to 1, because there's only one sign change. To find the number of possible negative zeros, I'll put it over here, I have to look at p of negative x. Well, p of negative x is 3 times negative x to the fourth, plus 2 times negative x cubed minus 8 times negative x squared minus 10 times negative x minus 1. Now we need to simplify this. What happens when you take a negative to the fourth power? It's still positive. What happens when you cube a negative? Negative times positive is negative 2x cubed. What happens when you square a negative? It stays positive, so that stays minus 8x squared, and a negative times negative is positive 10x minus 1. Now let's count the sign changes. I go from positive to negative. There's one sign change. Negative to negative doesn't change signs, but negative to positive changes signs, and positive to negative changes signs. So I have three sign changes here. That means that my number of possible negative zeros is either going to be 3 or 1. I decrease it by 2. The number of variations by a positive even integer. So you find the number of sign changes and it will be that many possible negative roots or you can decrease it by 2. Make sense? And that wraps up section 4.4.